بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأن محمدا عبده ورسوله إن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار اللهم أجرنا من النار وأدخلنا الجنة مع الأبرار اللهم أعنا على ذكرك وشكرك وحسن عبادتك ولا تجعلنا من الغافلين آمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today is session 27 and we're still in the second year of Al-Hijra Hijriya, the Islamic calendar, it's two and we are still in the city of Medina inshallah ta'ala we will continue today uh, how uh, the type of the students Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam had it because a class before we talked about the type and the kind of the best students for the best teacher on earth was. If he was a best teacher back then and he's still sallallahu alaihi wasallam, of course his immediate students were the best. And uh, we talked about some of their quality and what made them so good. So uh, most importantly, most most importantly, they did not ask much questions to, uh, uh, you know, what is the rules of this? What is the rules of that? And the one of the hadith, it scares me. It says, um, uh, it says that the, 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 the guy or the person, uh, the, worst, uh, the, the worst crime anyone can commit is if he asks questions to his prophets and then uh, because of his question Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbid some of the lawful used to be a lawful uh, so it become tight not only on him life become tight on all the followers later on so that's why uh, they kept silence as long as Rasulullah was among them unless if something misunderstanding or uh, they want to uh, they want to ask question to clarify they had the courage to ask for something to clarify about stuff they did not uh, understand whether ayat from the Quran as you know uh, one of his wife she asked she kept asking how everyone can enter hellfire uh, and some people do not enter hellfire because the martyr, they go straight to heaven, right? And that's when she said, but the Quran says some of them will go. So all of us as a human being, we're supposed to pass hellfire, which is Salat al-Mustaqim is uh, Allahu Akbar, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the heat and from the uh, uh, calamity of the Salat al-Mustaqim that day, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy. And the Prophet says uh, he will be standing in judgment day in the beginning of Salat al-Mustaqim to tell his ummah, uh, Allahumma sahil, Allahumma sahil. Oh Allah make it easy for you, oh Allah make it easy for you. The, your Prophet will make dua for you and he will encourage you uh, and with that attitude, not your mom, not your dad, not your spouse, not your husband, not your wife, not your children. Allahu Akbar. Look at the love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to his ummah. No other prophet will be there for his people. Subhanallah. Except Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Actually, there's uh, one hadith that one of the companions was like tearing while he was sitting next to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He, he told him, what abka, ma abka, ma abkaka, why you're crying? He goes, Ya Rasulullah, I love you so much and I'm sitting here and next to you. But when the resurrection day come, I know you're gonna go straight to heaven and I don't know where I'm gonna find you. I don't know even if I will see you ever there. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave him three things. He said, in the day of judgment, my ummah, my followers will spot me in three position. And those are the hardest position for all of us. Number one, it says, Al Al Haud. Al Haud by his lake. The Kawthar, Haud al Kawthar, the Prophet وسلم, will be there giving with his blessed hand a drink for his followers. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us that drink from his beloved hand. That's when he said, Al the Al Mizan, the scale, when you stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To be scaled, to put your good deed in one side and your bad deed in one side. Sister, nobody will be there comforting you or thinking about you. But the Prophet will be there for you. 
giving you his intercession, his shafa'ah. And the third place, he said, the beginning of Asirat al mustaqim Those are the horrible scene and the most scariest moment for any human being. So um, that's why, you know, how, yani, a, a prophet like that, uh, who won't like her? Who won't love her? Who won't follow her? I mean, that's a prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when we call him Muhammad, rahmatan lil alameen. He's a mercy for all mankind, as, of course, he's going to most be merciful to uh, his follower, yeah, Habibi, ya Rasulullah. So uh, then we talked about the last one. We're going to talk. The last one, it says, uh, I think I think we, we covered we covered all, uh, all. We covered the last one. Maybe Turkish to Al Amma Sakat Anu Shara. That's I just said that you have to stop asking about uh, what silence, what Allah and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were silenced about. All right. If you didn't bring the a, a topic up, uh, what would we ask? Right? Because subhanAllah, this uh, earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made everything is halal, but the haram were exception. So if there is no topic about forbidding something, don't say, is apple halal to eat? Imagine somebody come and ask Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is date halal to eat? And question like this, sometimes it's silly, you know, sometimes questions, uh, students, uh, it's a religious topic, class, uh, young kids, they ask so many questions, has nothing to do with the topic you're talking to them. I don't know where this idea come from in their head. They ask something like random questions. And sometimes you tell them, stay on the topic, stay on the topic, stay with me. <laughs> so that's why uh, we learn to be adab, uh, to uh, carry that uh, uh, manner in front of teachers, uh, especially when the teacher is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Manners in front of our imams, manners in front of our scholars, subhanAllah. Uh, and then two things we didn't talk about. It says, "Ertinam khilwat Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the the Sahaba they uh, taking advantage of the messenger uh, secul, secul, uh, seclusion seclusion when he's when he stay in the masjid doing nothing, finish the salah, finish his zikr. He did not pick up himself and go to. Uh, with Abu Bakr outside or with one of his companion outside, that's mean, or he doesn't have a visitors from different tribe, or he doesn't go to his room and close the door, that's mean, it's a sign for them. If you have question, come ask me, I have time. So that's when he sit down and he will look around and the companion will understand this is the time we have to ask Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Abi Musa Al-Ash'ari says, كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا صلى الفجر when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam finished Salat al-Fajr, inharafna ilayhi. Faminna misal man yasalhu an al-Qur'an, wa minna man yasalhu an al-Fara'id, wa minna man yasalhu an al-Ru'ya. So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam finished Salat al-Fajr and finishes Azkar, he will sit and uh, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari says, we will go approach him and sometimes we ask about question about the Qur'an, sometimes we ask about a question about what's the obligation or how you do obligation. And some of them, even if they have a dream, they will ask about the meaning of the dream, subhanAllah. And the last one, it says, uh, Pay attention to his condition. Uh, do not insist on him. Uh, if you know he's busy, you don't just say, hey, hey, answer me, answer me. I have a question. Stay, stay, wait for me. You know, when somebody stop you and you're rushing, sometimes you look at your time. It's a sign you're rushing, but you're embarrassed to leave. So if they see any sign like this about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they do not pay that, uh, uh, yeah, they do not insist to stop the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to engage with him. And sometimes people come from the Al-Badiyah. There's hadith here, Qala an Anas radiallahu anhu bin Malik. Anas bin Malik, one of the Sahabi, radiallahu anhu qal, nuhina an nas'ala Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam an shay. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Nuhina mean, he said, it's not good to ask. It's not forbidden, it's not haram. And Nahi is when, when it says do and don't. Don't is Nahi. But it's not really become forbidden, that's, that's too much. So Nuhina, uh, he, he said, don't. Nuhina, uh, and uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam an shay. He did not allow us much or encourage us much to ask him questions. Too much questions. 
فكان يعجبنا ان يجيء الرجل من اهل الباديه بين ذا كومبانيونز هو سيتينج ان هيز بريزنت سم تايمز a man from the arabian will come albadia is from the desert they will come and they will ask a question and the companion listen and they like that because they want to learn from that question but they didn't ask the question subhanallah wa nahnu nasma fajaa rajul min ahli albadia then one time a bedouin person came in faqala ya muhammad so he asked rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam um ya muhammad atana rasuluk فزعم لنا أنك تزعم أن الله أرسلك. What he said, he said, oh, there's a guy, you sent it to us, to our tents, to our, you know, uh, land. And he said that Allah chose you to be the messenger for all mankind. Is that right? So he, he's here to ask for himself. Is that right? قال, the Prophet answered one word, صدق. That man said the truth. وهكذا استمر. That's how رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم built his first generation, uh, first companions, men and women around him. سبحان الله. So now all this we talked because we just finished غزوة أحد, which is the first battle. We talked about it, I think, in حلقة 25 in detail. And now, right after that battle, let's see. Or during the battle, there is a very important stories we have to learn from the behavior of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. What kind of not only a teacher he was, what kind of a general he was, what kind of a leader he was. So one beautiful story here. It so uh, it shows so beautiful that while Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the morning of the uh, battle, before the enemy took their position, first the Prophet looked at the sky, says, "Oh." They're going to stand here, you face in the morning, the sunrise. Uh, he did that. Then he looked at their eyes. Their eyes were, you know, imagine you're in the desert outside and you're facing the sun rising. It's going to be hard on their eyes, right? So he said, no, 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 let's change the position. Because the enemy did not come yet. When the enemy arrived, he's going to face the army of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So uh, that's why the prophet was smart enough They came a night before and they were preparing themselves. They took the best spot, we said. It's a little bit up, up front. They destroy all the wheels. They throw stones in it, right? And they kept the biggest wheel next to them so they can drink and the enemy cannot drink. We said that. Then he said, okay, how about you turn your face, your back to the sunrise and you face the sunset. This way, it will be easier for your eyes to fight. And subhanAllah, that's what he did. And this way, when the enemy came, they have to keep looking to the sunrise direction, to the east, and their eyes was already becoming red and hard to see, especially when there is shining sword and shining clothes, maybe the, the, the armor, if someone have it, they're wearing. There is a reflection with the sun and everything, subhanAllah. So that was the best Uh, you know, uh, one of the technique of the army men can do it. But the second one, it says, while Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he was asking the companions to line next to each other, just like you line in the salat, and that show you that the unity of the army. So he puts them, and he keeps telling them. استو uh, استو just like when the imam uh, you know wants to uh, establish the salah in a minute he would say استو mean in 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 Arabic in English when he say استو in Arabic means uh, keep your line straight and you know be steady fast steadfast then every time he will look at the army he will look turn his face he will find this one person named سواد بن غزية he was in the first line. But when Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam makes sure the line is straight, this man will come and he will break the straightness of the line. He will come, you know, come to the front a little bit. Then the line is not straight anymore. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for the third time, while he's telling him, you know, keep the line straight. So he had a stick, and with this stick, uh, it says rumah, you know, the bow and the arrow, the bow. It says so he pushed his stomach. To tell him, go back and stay in the line, subhanAllah. Istawiya Sawad, and he told him, I told you, Sawad, stay on the same line. Faqala, Ya Rasulullah, awjatani. Sawad said, Oh Prophet, you hurt me. And it says, Sawad did not have even shirt on the top. That's how poor they were. They came out, maybe someone have a sirwal, only have like his pants. 
you know, baggy pants wearing. He doesn't even have a shirt to cover his stomach. SubhanAllah. They're ready to fight. Imagine now today, the army men, especially if you look at the TV, or at, the, at the pictures about the, D, uh, 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 the FDA, right? The Israeli army. Am I saying right? Inshallah. The Israeli army. Look how much they wear the clothes, the protection. Uh, I mean, the helmets, everything, right? They dress up extremely to protect themselves from death. But these people, most of them came like half body is naked and he's ready to fight. So while he's doing that, the Prophet ﷺ pushed him with his stomach and he told him, Ya Rasulullah, awjatani, you hurt my stomach. And I know Allah sent you to be in justice, so I need my revenge. That's what faqdini. He said that, and the companions were like, what are you talking about? You're the one who's missing the line. How could you say, I'm, I need revenge from the Prophet Imagine he's a general of the army. Fakishafa, that moment, the Prophet he pulled his shirt up and he showed his bare stomach and he gave him the same weapon he had it, we're gonna call it weapon, the stick or the, um, the bow. He gave it to him, he said, استقد. take your revenge now, ya Sawad. When he saw that, he dropped the stick and he jumped on the Prophet Sallallahu uh, bare stomach and he started kissing him. And then the Prophet was like, ما حملك على هذا يا سواد? What the heck? What are you doing? Why are you doing this to me? قال يا رسول الله. He said, oh Prophet, حضر ما ترى. We are about to die for the sake of Allah. فأردت أن يكون آخر العهد بك أن يمس جلدي جلدك. I want to be the last things happen in my life because I know I'm going to die today for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I want to die. But I want the last things happen to me is that my skin touched your skin. And it's the last skin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فَدَعَ لَهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ بِخَيْرِ So the Prophet made dua for him. For good things to happen to him. So just from this one hadith, look how much we learn. Islam First of all, we learn that Islam is something in order. Today, the Muslim, we live in chaos. We have no order. <laughs> we have no leader. We have no general. <laughs> so Islam, you know, insists to have order. Number two, al-adl al-mutlaq. Justice has to be absolute to everyone. It just because the general did something wrong does not mean the general is not going to be punished. The Prophet ﷺ accepted to be punished by the same victim. He caused him a pain, according to Sawad, to his stomach. He gave us a leadership, a model. La ilaha illallah. Number three, when the army men love their leader, look that love Sawad had. Everybody thinking about something else. At that moment, he think about, okay, I'm going to die. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to fight and die. When would be the last things I did? It's not like, oh my God, my wife, goodbye, my family, I'm not going to see them. I don't know. Oh, I don't know my, my wealth, what's going to happen with my wife, if he was married, if not, my mom. You know, all the materialistic, we think about it and look at him, what he's thinking. That's a love, the relationship between an army man and their leader. Then it says five, Jasad al-Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mubarak. The body of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's a blessed body. Wamasuhu fihi baraka, touching his hand or his body. It's a blessing. We're not going to understand that because first of all, you know, lucky his daughters and his wife or his aunties and, you know, immediate relationship he had, but lucky those, Companions who they will smell, they will swear that when they shake his hand, they will smell his beautiful body odor for days. Sometimes they wish they would never wash their hand to keep that odor on them. That's a natural from Rasulullah sallallahu blessed body. And that's what 
That's what exactly Sawad so knew, and that's exactly why he behaved the way he behaved. The stomach of the man is not an aura. So a woman won't you know, do that. But for men, even the prophet, when he pulled his shirt and he showed his naked stomach, that's not aura because aura to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa never been seen by, by, by not his immediate necessary people who has to see his private, like his wife maybe, his wives. Uh, no one saw, even in Jahiliya. In Jahiliya it says, uh, they used to uh, uh, take a bath uh, in outdoor, in the pool, uh, uh, or if they find a lake in the desert, everybody will take their clothes off and they will jump and, and wash themselves. Uh, and we know in Jahiliya, ignorant time also, they used to do tawaf around the Kaaba naked. Uh, but Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam neither did that in the tawaf, God forbid, neither, uh, one time he tried, he tried, he was with his friend outside and he was like a 20 maybe or younger. Uh, he wants to do the same, take a bath. It's a hot time and everybody's jumping in the water. Everybody took their clothes off. When he was about to do that, it says he fell asleep and he slept till all his friends have their happy time, good time. And they came out and was like, where are you where, Muhammad? <laughs> Subhanallah, Allah protected him. And we, we remember also when he was a shepherd man, uh, two times his friend will tell him, why you don't go watch? Uh, there is a wedding, there is a party or a musical party happening. Uh, they have boys and girls and they have a music and it's fun. Uh, I'll watch your sheep, go, go, enjoy, right? You remember? Two times he went, but was the two time when he go and he sit with all these people who who about the party to start, he will uh, feel to sleep and he will sleep till the sun come out and the sun will wake uh, wake him up. Subhanallah, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala protected him. All right, uh, during also uh, during also the preparation of the army, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he always encouraged and urged the believers to fight before the fight happened. And we know if we go to Surah Al-Anfal, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and tell him, Ya ayyuha nabi O Prophet, harrad al-mu'mineen ala al-qital, urge the believer to fight. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in advance, he promised his messenger and the messengers promised the army men, إِيَّكُمْ مِنْكُمْ عِشْرُونَ صَابِرُونَ يَغْلِبُوا مَأْتَيْنَ Tell them, if there is only 20 people in this crowd, having steadfast and have patient and ready to fight that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will make them to win, overcome 200. And if 100 of you is steady fast and will fight with a patient against the kuffar, he will uh, If there's 100 of you, they will defeat a thousand. Uh, and remember, we talked about the Lord. Only they were 317 fighters from the with Rasulullah verse 1000. Uh, and we know that. How did you know that they were 1000 of people of Quraysh came to fight? You remember, they captured two of the slave men when they came to take water for the army, they captured them and they brought them, right? right? And when they start beating them up, the companions, uh, telling them, tell us how many people there, tell us how many people in the army, they didn't know because they're slave men. They didn't know how to answer. So the prophet saw that, he didn't like that injustice happening to them. He said, stop, you know, hitting them. How are they gonna answer you when you are crushing them like this? So he asked him kind, kindly, how many camel they slout a day for the army to eat. And that's when they said, one day nine, one day 10. So 10 camels will feed 1,000 people. And that's when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, they are, there are 900 to 1,000 army in Quraysh army. Verse 300, hold on. So now, subhanAllah, uh, let's calculate. If there's 100 from the 300 are really serious, seriously have a patient and steady fast to fight the enemy, 
the whole thousand will be defeated. And we know the result, they were defeated. So subhanAllah, as if not only 100, as if 300 of them, all of them, they were steady fast and they all you know, got the victory. And only from the Muslim side, we said 17 people get killed. And from the uh, Kuffar, uh, Quraysh side, 70 people died, including the six, seven of the leaders of uh, Mecca. And then uh, they captured 70 uh, men uh, to be the captured uh, for a war prisoner. And subhanAllah, they did not know what to do with them. So let's go over the book and see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explain uh, what to do with the captured? Okay. So among those people first, among the people, uh, I, I, I mean, even if you don't speak Arabic, I'm sure you heard a lot about who is Abu Jahl. Uh, he has a naked name. Uh, he has a uh, he has a, <laughs> a step name. Uh, he has a different name. Uh, what we call him? We call him Firaun al Ummah, the Pharaoh of people of Mecca and people of Quraysh was Abu Jahl, versus the Pharaoh of. Uh, people of uh, Egypt, subhanAllah. So Abu Jahl was, was the worst man. If Abu Jahl accepted Islam uh, in Mecca, the whole Quraysh will accept Islam. So imagine now Abu Jahl died and he get killed. And then after that, we know Masra um, Umayyah bin Khalaf. And when subhanAllah, Abu Jahl was dying, it says, uh, Abu Jahl when, was dying, it says, who came to, to separate the head from his body, he put his skinny feet, his name, Abdullah bin Mas'ud. Abdullah bin Mas'ud, one of the poorest uh, Sahabi in city of Mecca. He was insignificant and his body was weak, skinny. Uh, people used to make fun for his legs, how skinny. Even the companions, when, once upon a time in, in city of Medina, Abdullah bin Mas'ud was climbing a tree and they saw they saw his skinny legs and his skinny thigh. And then everybody started laughing. Look, look at his legs. And you know what the Prophet said? Wallahi, his skinny feet is so heavy by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's eyes on the scale in the day of judgment. That's that skinny legs, what's gonna make him to go and in, in, in the scale and judgment day to be so heavy for him to enter paradise. So now. Abdullah bin Mas'ud put his feet on the chest of Abi Jahl. And you know what? Abi Jahl is wounded by so many other companions of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yet he's still not ready to say, okay, 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 I'm dying. Uh, let me accept as Fir'aun said, Al-Yawm, uh, when Fir'aun was drowning, he said, today I believe in the Lord of Musa and Harun. And he said, wa'ana min al-Muslimin. And subhanAllah, he just accepted Islam that moment uh, too late for him, but the moment of death. But Abi Jahl dying, you know what he says? When Abdullah bin Mas'ud's foot was on his chest, he said, لَقَدْ ارْتَقَيْتَ مُرْتَقَى صعب. Wow, look, look, ya, ya Abdullah bin Mas'ud, look the, the status you got. You're stepping my chest, my chest. يَا رِوَيْعَيِّ الْغَنَمْ and he gave him not only a shepherd man, because that's the insignificant job anybody can have. It. It's you just you're a shepherd man. mean not a shepherd man. It's a small size of being a shepherd man. He belittled him with with Abdullah bin Mas'ud while he was dying. Then he separated his head and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa did not believe that Abi Jahl was dying till Abdullah bin Mas'ud brought his head to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and show him. Allahu Akbar. Masra Umayyah bin Khalaf. And we know Umayyah bin Khalaf, how bad also he was, right? So when Umayyah bin Khalaf was dying, of course, who separated his head from his body? Guess, his slave man, Bilal. Umayyah bin Khalaf, the one who used to beat Bilal, radiallahu anhu, in the city of Mecca, when Bilal accepted the witness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only, right? And he will hire the children of Mecca and he will tie Bilal with the 
uh, chains on his legs and his neck and they will pull him like pulling a toy or something in the uh, middle of the heat in Mecca and he will pay the children to do that to uh, to play with the body of Bilal now Bilal right there and he is the one who uh, killed Umayyah bin Khalaf and then it says and Umayyah bin Khalaf has a very good body body friend because they were very good body friend in uh, Mecca doing business uh, trade business together and with them uh, Auf, Abdurrahman bin Auf we know Abdurrahman bin Auf he came to Islam very very early time and when he saw Umayyah bin Khalaf and he told him you're my best friend you're my best friend you're not gonna help me to run away and that's when Abdurrahman bin Auf he says that friend friendship between you and me is gone not anymore subhanallah and that's when uh, Bilal will come and he will finish the job then it says, uh, um, Um Safwan, uh, Abdurrahman, uh, Subhanallah, Umayyah, Umayyah bin Khalaf, Umayyah bin Khalaf, the head of the Kufr, uh, his uh, wife later on accepted Islam. And then when they look what's how Islam separates between, uh, uh, mother and son when the son is wrongdoing and the mother is on the Islam side uh, look what she, she did one day Umm Safwan bint Umayya قيل لأم Safwan bint Umayya بعد إسلامها وقد نظرت إلى الحباب بن المنذر بمكة she looked at الحباب بن المنذر in Mecca when he was a Muslim again Habab was one of the weakest man in Mecca back then but he killed the son of Umayya bin Khalaf his name Ali he chopped his leg first. And then they show the mother, that's Habab, the one who chopped your son Ali's leg. Don't you hate him? She goes, Ali is my son, but not anymore. He, he died in a state of disbelieving. But Al-Habab is my son now. Me and him are brothers in Iman, in Islam. He's like my son now, subhanAllah. That's even the woman, even the woman who we think we follow our atifa, our emotion, emotion, right? You know, you drop all the emotion when you are seriously believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and love Allah and love his messengers, the way the first companions loved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Ubaidah bin Sa'id bin al-As, also uh, one of the head of the kufr, uh, it says, when story says, قال الزبير بن العوام الزبير describing لقيت يوم بدر عبيدة عبيدة بن سعيد بن العاص وهو مدجج الزبير بن العوام he saw uh, عبيدة بن سعيد بن العاص he was one of the hatred to Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم but when he came to this army he he had a money, so he protected all his body. He had a cloth. There is no way you can put the sword in his body to kill him. But as Zubay saw, I saw only his eyes, even his having mask in his face. La yura minhu illa aynai. He saw the eyes and he knew that is Ubaidah. Then uh, he had a nickname. They used to call him Dal Kirsh, Abal Kirsh. Uh, because he's so wealthy, so his stomach is like uh, full of money and full of gold, right? Abu Kirsh, they call him. When he saw that, he said, Wallahi, I knew him. I knew exactly. رجلي عليه ثم تمطأت فكان الجهد أن تنزعها. He threw his arrow and he brought it to his eye. Then he fell. And then he said, I climbed his body and I want to pull the row so hard, I couldn't pull it till another companions came and helped me. That tells you how deep the arrow went through his eye, as if it went through his eye to all to his skull. When they pulled that arrow, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked Az Zubair, "Let me have that arrow." He gave it to him. After Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam died. It passed to Abu Bakr and he kept it by him. After Abu Bakr died, it passed to Umar ibn al-Khattab and he kept it by him. Then Umar ibn al-Khattab died, it passed to Uthman. Hatta qutila Uthman. When Uthman got killed, they found it by the family of Ali radiallahu anhu. Fatalabaha Abdullah ibn Zubair. Who requested the arrow? The son of the Zubair. 
who was born in the city of Medina by then. And he requested it. He kept it till he died and then the arrow disappeared. That's how that arrow was valuable to kill just one shot, just like Dawood alayhi salam, when he threw the slingshot to the Goliath and he killed him on his forehead and he was the most scary enemy of Bani Israel. Everybody said, we're not gonna fight them because look at the giants, man, the leaders, right? Then Dawood alayhi salam said, I could kill him. And after that, how Dawood alayhi salam became the king because the king promised whoever killed the Jalut, Talut, Talut, his name Talut, so who will kill him, then uh, he will marry his daughter to him and he will become the next king. That's how Dawood alayhi salam became king, then he became a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. Then it says, Masra al Aswad al Makhzumi. Al Aswad al Makhzumi also was one of the bad, shuras mean a very bad, bad language, say al khuluq, bad manner. Uh, he will do anything to, uh, you know, uh, punish the believers and, and punish Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Mecca. So when he came, al Aswad al Makhzumi, Allah la ashrabanna man hawdi. He is the one who said, I will. He swear in Allah that I will go and drink from the lake of Badr where the army of Rasulullah sallallahu was there, right? And he did not care. That shows you the bravery of Al-Aswad from the Kuffar side. And when he came, uh, Hamza radiallahu anhu attacked him and he uh, chopped his one of the leg. So he fell, but he didn't run away. He didn't turn his face to go back to his group of the uh, Kuffar, he goes, I swear in God, I'm gonna fulfill my promise to God that I'm gonna drink from the lake, I'm gonna drink from the lake. He insists. So he start claw crawling to the lake while his blood, uh, while, while his leg was bleeding. And when he came, uh, it says, um, uh, So he came, he crawled to the lake till he reached the lake. And then he put his right hand to take the water to fulfill his promise and his oath to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hamza radiallahu anhu followed him. Then he hit his neck and he killed him right there by the hand. And that put also the fear in the heart of the kuffar for that moment. Allahu Akbar. Okay. So uh, let's talk about, uh, you know, 16, 17 uh, people who died in, uh, in the Muslim side. One of them says Haritha bin Surafa. When he died, an Anas radiallahu anhu qal, Uthiba Haritha fayyom bedr. So he was a young man. It, when, when we say young, uh, at the age of 13, 14, 15, they used to have a permission to come and fight. He insists to fight, so he came. He's young, he's ghulam. فجاءته أمه إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقالت يا رسول الله I know that my young son حارثة he died in the battle of Badr can you tell me if he's in his if he's already in paradise I will rest otherwise I'm gonna cry over the death of my son and he said يا ويحكي ويحكي wow to you أم حارثة do you think he only hit one paradise فإنها جنات عد he reached gardens, not one garden. Kathira, wa innahu fi jinnat al firdaus al ala. He is in the highest position of paradise called al firdaus. Subhanallah. So she was rested. And then we have another one called Auth bin Haritha. Auth bin Haritha says, uh, when he died, also, قال يا رسول الله ما يضحكك الرب من عبده قال حدثني عاصم بن عمرو بن قتادة أن عوف بن مالك وهو ابن عفراء قال يا رسول الله ما يضحك الرب من عبده This is be, the moment before he died. He asked his messenger, رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم, he said, ما يضحك الرب من عبده What made Allah so happy from his servant? You know what he said? غمسة يديه في العدو حاسرة The Prophet said, to go engage the enemy while he has a bare chest. Even maybe he doesn't have a hand 
good weapon to fight his enemy, but he has no fear. He will attack the enemy with all his body. So he had this armor. La ilaha illallah haritha. Had this armor. He took it off and he threw it and he took the sword and he went straight, you know, engaging the army and he fought till he died. You know, subhanAllah, today when we see how many people dying, dying, dying in Gaza and we say, my gods are not surrendering. There must be something very special about them. They must be seeing the angels there. They must be seeing when their immediate family in large number dying, they must, they must have something really in their heart, in their faith, or they have a vision, we don't see it. We don't see it. This is the same, this is a, this is a condition of the companions who they were with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Of course they wanna win this battle. You know, of course, even people of Gaza wants to win the battle. But imma nasr, imma shahada. Two things, two things what the believers want. Victory, if not, die. Die for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Reach that level because you're gonna die anyway. But what a way to die. Reach and hit the highest level of paradise. That's their ultimate goal. And they achieve. Some of them achieve that moment. SubhanAllah. Another one says, Sa'ad bin Khayshima and Thumma Abi. So Sa'ad and his father came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and both of them wants to come and fight. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, no, not both of you, because somebody has to stay with the family to look after the woman. So uh, Sa'ad says me, the father said me, and then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, let's uh, saham, as some mean, let's take a lottery. So they put the two names and they selected one name. Who came? Sa'ad. The son's name came. And the father said, Give me your turn. Come on. I'm the father. I want to go fight. You're a young man. You stay home. You know what Sa'ad says? Well, la wallah, my father, I know you want to take my spot, but not for this. Not for this. I want paradise for me today. And Sa'ad gets killed that day. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Then, uh, who do we have here? Okay, one of the one of the companions who Hudayfa bin Utba, Utba bin Rabi'ah was killed. Utba is one of the worst enemy of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Utba and Utayba and Umayya and Abi Jahl and Asawad and Ubaida bin Saad. I, I mean, these are big generals in the army of the Israeli today. Imagine they're dying one after one. Inshallah, that will happen. And look. So Huzaifa is there, he's one of the companions. His own father, which is Utba, the worst enemy of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the believers, when he died, they were pulling his body to bury in the area and the area. And the, 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 the son is right there, Huzaifa. Huzaifa's face it became red and you could see the sadness, extremely sadness in his face. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked him, Ya Aba Huzaifa, as if you did not like what happened with your father. Your father got killed. I understand. It's sad. Right? You know what he said? I have no doubt about giving a victory for Allah and his messenger. That's not what I am so upset right now. ولكن, my father was wise man. Why he didn't accept this message? That's what made me so angry and so upset. He was a wise man. He was intelligent man. You know, that's why when we see smart people don't come to Islam today, that's what hurts. That's what hurts. I wish he didn't die in the state of Qutr. I wish he died in the state of Iman. SubhanAllah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam khair. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will pay attention to every face, expression even, in his army and in his companies. So that's how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he will make individual prayer for each one of them. 
another one, Umair bin Abi Waqqas. Uh, I don't know what is that. Oh, yeah, uh, I, now I understand the meaning. Okay, Umar bin Abi Waqqas, he was hiding and he would put mask around his face. He will hide his face from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So uh, one of the uh, brothers uh, named Sa'ad, he saw him. He said, what's wrong with you, Umair? Why you keep, why you're away, avoiding Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the battle? He goes, you know what? I am avoiding him because Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not give me a permission. I am too young to come and fight. But I want to die for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he died in that battle. So these are some examples of the people who died in the time of uh, Ghazwat Badr. But uh, scholars and the Quran also does not name Ghazwat Badr by Badr, the name of the wills, the you know, Ahwad Badr. Only. But uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called, called Al-Furqan, Yawm Al-Furqan. The day is where the truth and the false was divided. That victory, it gave a lot of support of the establishment of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the city of Medina. Now, now, when Kufar Quraysh lost, and of course they ran away, of course, there are 70 of them died, including the generals. Of course, 70 of them were captured. Now imagine all the Bedouin and Arabia surrounded in Mecca, and they think and they know that the army of Quraysh and the people of Quraysh is the largest tribe around them, is defeated by such a small number, by their own enemy, who they went after him to kill him. Imagine now, what are they going to think about Quraysh anymore? Now imagine when Rasulullah returned in Mecca, what is the people of the Jew in the city of Medina, uh, when he returned in Medina, what is the people of the Jew going to think twice before they think even to announce animosity against Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa where they were about what? To break their treaty with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa If the Prophet lost that time, that will be the end. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that night, he was making such dua when everybody was sleeping. He was making dua and crying, 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 telling Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala that if we lose today, you're not gonna be worshiped on this earth after today. This is the day of Yawm Al-Furqan. This is the day of the victory of Islam. This is the day where Islam is rooted in the heart of the believers, in the heart of all those people who they're yet to come accept Islam. They know Islam is growing. They know Islam is now having image and the leader Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, how he treated these uh, people, the, the uh, captured of the uh, prisoner, let's see, because now uh, Hamas has a prisoner, right? And we saw that from those people who they were released, that they were really treated very kind, very nice. They gave them the best of they can to those prisoners of the Israeli, right? When they release them. So let's look at Rasulullah Sallallahu and learn from him. First of all, it was no rules from Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. How are you gonna handle a prisoner of all? Secondly, how are you gonna handle the, uh, the fevers of the, uh, the spoil of the wars? because they have a lot of property. Each army man of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam got three camels when the enemy ran away, leaving behind their camels, their horse, and their property. SubhanAllah. So when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam finished the battles, he stayed in the land of the battle for three long days. First of all, they sent a message to Mecca, the Kuffar that they lost, and they were naming the leaders who died. So Mecca got the bad news already. Same, the believers sent a message to Medina that the Prophet won, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the Muslim army won. 
right? But the army stayed in that land for three long days, taking care of the dead people from the Muslim side and the disbeliever side, taking care of all the spoil of the war and waiting uh, two or three nights for maybe the enemy will return. Maybe they will return and they will attack them if they were uh, leaving the area of the battle. So subhanAllah, that's a way of the general thinking. Yes, you win this, this moment, but stay. Stay in the area of your battle. Don't leave till you make sure the enemy reach their land, subhanAllah. So now when they brought the 70 people to, to the city of Medina, uh, and they brought all the property. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam divided his army after the war into three groups. One group look after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, small group, but they were looking uh, safety of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in case somebody will come back from the army at night and will sneak in and will kill Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a cold blood, right? So they were protecting him. The, the second uh, group, it says, who collected the spoil of the war and the last group, they were going after the army further and further to make sure that the army running, going back home. So they were busy looking after the army. So after those, all these things happened, what happened is that group who they were collecting the spoil of the army, they claimed everything what they collected to themselves. They said, no, we got it, it's ours. But that group who watched the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they said, no, we have a right of this because we were here protecting Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We were not like staying at home. And the other group who looked after the army, they said, hey, what if the army came, what if the enemy came back, the army of the enemy came back and attacked you and they, or they took back whatever they left behind. You won't have anything. So we have a right in it. So everybody start like a disagreement between the three groups and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is watching. Now, let's see how the people thinking about materialistic, right? What happened in SubhanAllah. Uh, sometimes we make dua to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala if the people of Gaza win and this, ba this uh, uh, bad uh, war end, how it's gonna be the behavior of the Muslimin. Inshallah, they will be in the best way, right? Make dua for that. So uh, now uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam don't know what to do, doesn't know what to say. There's no rules, nothing came from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Till Surah Al-Anfal now, the beginning of the Surah started by saying, Yes, Al-Wunaka Al-Anfal. Al-Anfal is now the spoil of the war. They're arguing, they're talking about it. It's about, you know, this agreement is going to happen between the believers, the Sahaba who just fought. <laughs> Subhanallah, it says, yes, Tell them immediately the answer. All the spoil of the war belong to Allah and His Messenger. Look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed them. Fear Allah. Be aware of Allah. Taqu. I mean, they were in a state of taqwa, of course, when they were fighting. They did jihad. This is their first jihad. This is their first throwing themselves to die. To you know how we describe very few of them, but all of them, I'm sure, they were in this state of mind to fight and to die and right. But Allah remind them at taqwa, fear Allah. Okay, wa aslihu baynikum, reconcile between of the groups. Sit down and talk and say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. I'm sorry. Yes, you did your job. You protected the beloved of us is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? Aslihu data baynikum. Fix the problem, what's happening. Wa ati'u Allah wa rasulahu in kuntum mu'mineen. And obey Allah and his messenger if you think you are a believer. What a immediate correction behavior by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't you think Islam is just jihad, fighting, salat, and this disagreement, hate, envy, right? Between the brotherhood, that is not good. Islah, that al bain. We have to be united. We have to be loving each other. We have to love for your brother what you loved for you. That moment they loved all the spoiled, that group, they loved it for themselves. 
What is Iman? Iman, it says, love for your Muslim brother, what you love for yourself, right? Aslihu that abaynikum. In kuntum mu'mineen, if you think and consider you, you are a believer, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, innamal mu'minun, and Allah remind them, who is the believers? Alladheena idha dhukir Allah, wajilat qulubahum. Those are the ones when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention, Allah's name mention, wajilat qulubahum. Their hearts come back to Allah and their heart become full of fear and love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Awakeness of Allah. The heedless moment is gone because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name mentioned. وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ When they hear the recitation of the verses of Allah, زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا Their iman increases. وَعَلَى رَبِّيَمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ And they said, you know what? Oh Allah, you are our agent. We depend on you. You take care of us. You tell us what to do, and we are here to listen to you. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remind them, the state of the believers. They pray. Hey, you're about to get rich. What are you going to do? Al infaq. You're going to spend from the wealth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave it to you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those are the true believers. They will earn. They will earn higher level by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And forgiveness. And rizq kareem. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will pursue his bounty on them in this dunya and in the akhirah. As we see how the companions became rich and rich and rich during this establishment of the Islam, subhanallah. Right? Right? So we're going to start here. Uh, subhanallah. And then, of course, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala divided Divided in ayah number 41. Okay, now what are we going to do? Okay, all this spoil is belong to Allah and his messenger. What is, what is the messenger going to do with this? It says, وَعْلَمُوا No, Allah says, وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّمَا غَنِمْتُمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ Whatever you got from your enemy, فَإِنَّ لِلَّهِ خُمُسَهُ وَلِلْرَسُولِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did the dividing. One-fifth belong to Allah and his messenger. Absolute control that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will do whatever he wants to do with that one-fifth of all this property they got. Of course, Allah is not going to say, this is for Allah. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, he has absolute control in control into one-fifth of the wealth. وَلِذِ الْقُرْبَى وَالْيَتَامَى وَالْمَسَاكِينِ وَابْنِ السَّبِيلِ And of course, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what he's going to do with it? He will spend it to immediate family, orphan, poor people, travelers, a lot of travelers coming to the city of Medina. City of Medina is not only Muhajirin and Ansar anymore. Islam is spreading. Any people who are around the tribe, around the Badia, around the city of Medina or Mecca from outside, whoever accept Islam, what do they do? They come to the city of Medina. They have to be near Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But when they come, they come, traveler, Maybe, maybe they have land and they have a sheep back then, but they don't bring it with them. You have to give it to them. So, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he could be, come the richest man by collecting every time they have a barrel, every time they have a spoil of war, one fifth belong to him. And he will do absolutely, he has a right to do whatever he wants to do with that. But would he keep anything? La ilaha illallah. The Prophet وسلم, did not change even his mat. He did not change his pillow. He did not change the, the condition and the way he was living, the way he arrived the city of Medina, the way he built his house for all his wives. He did not make them live that rich and, 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 and different lifestyle just because the Prophet وسلم, got some wealth, but he will spend it. And Every army man who participated in this barrel will reach the four fifth, and the Prophet وسلم, will divide it fairly among them equally. Equally, subhanAllah. Doesn't matter the age, doesn't matter the title, doesn't matter what. And that courage Allah also in the future for people to join the army. Because the first army, it was no, no obligation on anyone. Actually, 
some people of Medina and Ansar came with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but the, the, the first battle was not obligation of every man in the city of Mecca, uh, Medina, to come out, whether Muhajiri or Ansari, to come out and fight with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that, that time. That's why the number was very small, subhanAllah. Um, let's see now. So among those people who they were captured, right, the prisoners of the war, Uqba uh, bin Abi Mu'ayt when Nudr ibn al-Hanas got killed. Two men from the 70. Because when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got the men, and he returned now to Medina, he sat down asking Majlis al-Shura. He asked, you know, he consults his consultant, especially Abu Bakr and Umar. It doesn't do anything unless it came directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he asked, he said, what are we going to do with the prisoners? You know what he said? Uh, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he said, Ya Rasulullah, those are our people, right? Our people, some of them, the father of so-and-so. Let's show them mercy. Let's free them all and send them back to their, uh, to Mecca, but after we put price on each head. So this way, we will collect more wealth from our enemy. So 70 men, two gonna die soon, the rest, hey, ransom. You want your man, you want your husband, you want your son, give this much money. This way, Rasulullah uh, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was really in the mercy side. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Asabt, you're Absolutely, your idea is a very good idea. What about you, Ya Umar? Umar ibn al-Khattab said, La wallah, Ya Rasulullah, those men came to kill us. Those men have intention to kill you. Those men who is the one who forced us to leave Mecca. Wallah, their head has to be separated. They're kuffar. Let's kill them because when they go back, they're going to come again and fight us again. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, and kill them in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That showed you the bravery of Umar ibn al-Khattab versus the mercy of Abu Bakr. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told them, Asabt, you're right. I understand where you come from. And so on, so on. He asked some of the companions, what should we do with them? And then uh, they want to keep them. Then let's see where is the ayat. Uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes. Till now, there is no hukum from Allah. Let's go back to Surah Al-Anfal, ayah number 70. 41, what to do with the spoil of the uh, war? Uh, divided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everybody accepts, everybody happy, nobody will object. Now, ayah 70. Ya ayyuhan nabi, O Prophet, qul liman fi aydikum min al-asra. Tell those people of the world prisoner, you have them. Tell them and talk to them. If Allah know that what's in your heart is a better now than the intention you had when you came to fight, you were kafir, maybe your heart now becoming toward Islam. If that's the condition of your heart, Know that Allah knows what's in your heart. And Allah will replace you in a better condition that you, than what's you're in right now. SubhanAllah. لكم, and Allah will forgive you the bad intention you had when you came. Wallahu ghafurun rahim. You still have a chance to accept this beautiful religion and Allah will forgive you. I mean, that act is something not to forgive you, enemy. They came to kill you. They have intention to kill you. Kill them, right? But yeah, there is no permission to kill them. وَإِنْ يُرِيدُوا خِيَانَتَكَ فَقَدْ خَانُوا اللَّهَ مِنْ قَبْلِ And tell them, those war, uh, prisoner of the war, if they want to cheat on you, so they're going to return to Mecca, then they're going to come back and to cheat on you, let them know that they already cheated on you and they cheated on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they have the intention to kill, to kill you. فَأَمْكَنَ مِنْهُمْ And look how they ended. They ended to be your prisoner. Wallahu alim al hakim. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, uh, he, uh, he said, uh, he told Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he told his prophet that, oh yeah, you want to have a prisoner? You want to feel like, you know, to, to treat them, to capture them 
the Prophet ﷺ did not give permission to his army men to capture anyone, but they did it anyway. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed them, since you didn't have a permission to capture the enemy, right? And bring them as a prisoner, this is what you're gonna do with them now. So he addressed them. What did they do? The Prophet ﷺ came and to them and he told them, let's see now. Let's send a message to each family of you and pay for each head if they were coming from rich family. Let's ask them big money. If they were so poor, let's just forgive them and send them back to Medina. They don't want to become Muslim, to Mecca. They don't want to become Muslim, that's fine. So he looked among those 70 men and found so many poor of them. They have no family. They came, they were forced to join the army. They came, okay, go ahead, go back to your family. You don't wanna be Muslim. You don't wanna join with us, that's fine, go back. So he released them and they returned to Mecca. But those rich people, let's see what will happen with, imagine Al-Abbas radiallahu anhu, the uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was one of the captured in that war. As we know, some scholars, they said Al-Abbas, when he left, uh, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa left him in Mecca, Al-Abbas secretly, he accepted Islam. And that secret was between only Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and Al-Abbas. Why? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa told him, stay there in Mecca and be my eye, be I my spy. And don't announce that you are a believer, right? But when he came with the army, he was forced to come to the army because if he doesn't join the army and come, then they're gonna say, hey, what's wrong? Like Abu Jahl, the other uncle, uh, uh, not Abu Jahl, Abu Lahab, the other uncle, he has to join the army when he, when all the leader of Mecca coming, right? But Abu Lahab, Amr Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the uncle of Rasul, what did he do? He was coward. He said, no, I'm not going to go fight. I'm scared. I'm scared. The Prophet cursed me. I'm scared. Uh, I know I'm going to die if I go. So he uh, brought this man who he owe him a lot of money. He forgave him all the money he lended him. And he said, go fight in my name. And that's how Umayyah bin Khalaf left. Abi Lahab said, okay, you don't want to come? Don't want to come. But send somebody to fight in your name, right? But Al-Abbas came, the uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa came and they captured them. When the people of Medina and Ansar saw the uncle of Rasulullah, they know him, he must be the bad man. Why? Because he is the one who was protecting his own nephew when they met Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during the three years coming to do Hajj, right? In the city of Mina, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with the secret mubayaa, he shook the hand of the 70 men, right? To do the promising, the, the covenant between them and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Abbas was always there protecting his nephew, even though he did not accept Islam. Just like, or Alanan at least, just like Abi Talib. Abi Talib was not a Muslim, but as long as he was alive, no one, no one can hurt Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He protected him. Same with Abi al-Abbas. So when they saw Anna Abi al-Abbas, when they saw al-Abbas, the Ansar felt a little bit like, oh, he's not a bad man. He's not that bad. We can't kill him. We can't just kill him. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, they brought Al-Abbas to him. He said, yeah, yeah, Abbas. He goes, you know, you know my, my condition. I was forced to come. I am your uncle. Send me, send me back. Send me back for free. Just like you sent it, you free some men. The prophet says, oh no, no. You are one of the richest men. We need more money from you than anyone else. Not only that, you need to also to free uh, to pay for your own nephews because the son of Al-Harith, when cousin of Rasulullah, he was also now a Muslim that, back then, also was one of the captured and another one, his brother. And they asked Al-Abbas, they don't have money to pay for themselves. You're going to pay money for yourself and for your two nephews. You, you want to be free? You will be free. But Al-Abbas says, okay, okay, Rasulullah, I will do that. 
Okay, yeah, Muhammad, I will do that. But listen, I don't have much money to give it to you. I'll give you some what I have now. And the Prophet said, no, 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 no. I know what you have. I know you left with your wife, with your wife, and you buried in your house. And you told her, if I get killed in the battle, this is the money for you to take care of you and your children. You have a lot of money buried in your backyard. We want some of that money. This shows you how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam just with his people. He treated his own uncle and asked him to pay even more than anyone else from those other men, even though that's his own uncle. Habibi ya Rasulullah. That's the leader. That's the kind of the leader. When we have leaders like this today, we will win the battles. We will win, defeat the enemy. We will be united. We will be a very good Muslim, right? Sometimes we say we need leaders. Sometimes we say the problem is us too. <laughs> Habibi ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he told him, you and Umm al-Fadl is his wife. You and your wife, you buried containers with gold coin. So you're going to send us some money for you to be free. Wallahi ya Rasulullah, inni la'alamu annaka Rasulullah. Al-Abbas said, I swear, nobody know that I buried under the ground money or gold coin but my wife. And I know that you are a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فأحسب, فأحسب لي تعالى منك فقد نفسه وابني, وابني أخويه وحليفه فأنزل الله تعالى. So he did pay. He did pay a large, a large, a large money. How much he said? فأعطاني الله مكانا العشرين وقية. So look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. يا, يا, يا أيها النبي. The ayah we just read, ayah number 70. If those people of the prisoner uh, of yours, yours. If they know, if they change what's within in their heart, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace them better, right? Al-Abbas later on, after he accepted Islam, he said, Wallahi, makan al uqiya. He gave 20 uqiya. Uqiya is like pounds. 20 pounds of gold coin. He paid for himself and for his own nephews. He said, Wallahi, after, every time I will go and do, try to do any business, put my hand on a stone, that stone as if it's turned into gold. Allah replaced me with more multiplied goodness than the one I freed myself that day. And that fulfilled the ayah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he accepted Islam later on. In the opening of Mecca, Fatah Mecca, that's when Al-Abbas loudly, he was Muslim, and Umm al fadl of, of course, became Muslim, and the rest of the cousin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam accepted Islam. Wow. And we know one more story, and, and I'm going to let you go. Abil As, Abil As, the husband of Zainab, he was captured. We talked about her. And uh, when they captured, he said, this is your son-in-law, let him go. No, he won't let him go. And that's when Zainab, his wife, the daughter of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, still in Mecca, right? She is the one who sent the necklace to free her husband. And the necklace, when arrives Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he opened the bag and he saw the necklace, he recognized that was a necklace of Khadija radiallahu anha. She gave it as her wedding gift when Zainab married Abul As. And that's when he called Abul As and he told him in secretly, I let you go, take this necklace back, give it back to your wife, but I want Zainab to come back. And she's not your wife anymore. We would stop here as I mean, by me. Right? Jazakumullah khairan. If anything I made right, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything was wrong from me, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me. The details of the seerah, it's such beautiful stories in every corner, in every individual human. 
Ya Allah, help us to understand and learn the wisdom, inshallah ta'ala, and love this beautiful religion, love, love Rasulullah, love the companions, as we were asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hubb sahaba min al-Iman. Loving the companions is from your Iman. Assalamu alaikum.